go. So, we've been talking pretty extensively about databases uh, from more of a systems perspective for the last uh, couple of weeks. Now we're going to move into uh, a little more, I guess, mathy theory stuff. I'm going to try and keep it somewhat high level, uh, but please stop me if, if I go too fast. Please ask questions. Um, that's really the only way I've, of knowing whether or not you're, you're keeping up. Um, I'll try and keep things at a, at a reasonable pace, but uh, please, I, I have a tendency to go on, so uh, do not hesitate to ask questions. Anyway, um, so a while back we talked about uh, different ways of representing data. Uh, in fact, the very first a uh, couple of lectures of the class were about uh, defining schemas. And while I, I gave sort of a sense of how one might define a schema, I didn't go into too much depth on um, what exactly constitutes a good schema, or how, how you uh, might uh, quantify uh, what it means for a schema to be good. And uh, today we're going to, today and possibly a little bit of Wednesday, uh, we're going to try and make that notion a bit more concrete. Uh, so I'm going to start off with this general idea of, of redundancy. Now, uh, thanks to Gene Roddenberry's dislike of uh, currency, I'm going to switch to a slightly different uh, sci-fi series here um, for my example. But the, here we have a simple table uh, which contains an officer ID, a set of names, a post, uh, a posting, uh, a rank, and a salary. And if, you, if you're uh, looking closely at this, uh, at this t data table, you might notice something. Namely that uh, commanders earn uh, 180,000 credits, while lieutenants earn 120,000 uh, credits. There is some level of redundancy in this table. In, in particular, uh, there is a dependency uh, from salary to rank. The salary field depends on the rank field. And this is something that uh, may not be entirely obvious from, from this specific table, but if I were to tell you that an officer's salary depends on their rank, then all of a sudden this, this table is, is now storing uh, a considerable amount of redundant information. So what's wrong with that redundancy? Well, uh, first off, it's, it's wasted space. So uh, for every uh, for every row in this table, we're storing two separate values, a uh, rank and a salary, when we can get away with only one of those. Um, the other thing is that what happens when we insert a new table into a, a sorry, a new row into a table like this? Um, how would we assign a salary value to that particular row? How, how would we decide on the salary value of this new officer. Um, what happens if we delete certain rows? So for example, uh, you'll note that there was only one captain uh, in, in that data set. So what happens if we delete that row? We suddenly lose all information about salaries uh, for the, the captain. And well, there's a bunch of consistency issues. Now if we, it's possible to change the default salary for a uh, for one officer of a given rank without changing the salary of other officers. And in order to keep things uh, consistent, we don't want to allow that. So the, the, the core theme of today's lecture is this idea of uh, eliminating this sort of redundancy by take, uh, being able to identify this, this sort of redundancy and very quickly uh, decide on ways of working around it changing the schema of a relation uh, by a process called decomposition uh, that allows us to, to get new schemas that are, are more effective. So the, I'm going to define decomposition in a very broad sense. Uh, we have a relation with some set of columns, and we replace it with some new set of relations, two or more uh, new relations, each of which contains some subset of uh, the attributes of the original relation. I'll define that a little more precisely later on, but just to give you sort of an idea, um, we want to partition a relation into smaller chunks, into 
projections of that original relation. Now, the, the two high-level questions I want you to have in the back of your minds, because that's pretty much what I want you to take away from, from today's lecture, is when is decomposition a useful thing? And uh, something I want you to think about, because I'm going to ask you later on uh, in the class, what exactly does this cost us? Why, why is uh, this event a good representation, or why might we want to use this or, or this? As with all things, decomposition is, is a trade-off between you have many different options, and each of them uh, has certain benefits and drawbacks. So, um, decomposition defines the, the main theme, I guess you could say, the, the main concept of today's lecture is this idea of functional dependencies. So a functional dependency, I'm going to label that uh, x arrow y. Uh, so that is a functional dependency from x to y, uh, where both x and y are sets of attributes means that for every pair of tuples in any possible instance of R, any possible instance of R, regardless of whether or not they're actually in R at the moment, um, it must be true that if uh, T1 and T2 agree on X, they must also agree on Y. Uh, so essentially you can say that Y depends on X. If, if you know what X is, there is a single value of y that that maps to. And something I want to make absolutely clear about this, this is not a property of the relation instance itself. This is a, a property of, of uh, the, the application semantics. You can think of this as an integrity constraint. Um, so going back to the, the example before, um, I told you that officers make uh, sorry, that lieutenants make uh, 1,200 credits. It's entirely possible that someone could insert a lieutenant who made 1,300 credits. If I hadn't told you that lieutenants must make 1,200 credits, that would be perfectly fine. Uh, but what the functional dependency is, is telling us is basically that there's some sort of constraint, some sort of semantic constraint uh, on the data that, that tells us that if you know what x is, then you know what y is. Let me give you a bit more of a, a, an example. I'm going to use a, a simple notation here. Uh, I'm going to use the first letter of each attribute, and I'm just going to concatenate those attributes together. Uh, that basically is, you should read that as the set of attributes uh, OID, name, post, rank, salary. Um, so here are a couple of examples. Uh, so for the first one, the first, the most obvious one, uh, if I tell you that OID is a key, you can think of that as a functional dependency from O to the entire relation, all of the attributes of, of the relation. Um, obviously, if you know what the, the officer ID is, you can look up the corresponding data values for that particular officer. Now, is uh, is the reverse true? If you have something that, if you have a set of attributes that has, based on what I've told you, uh, if you have a set of attributes that have a, a functional, if there is a functional dependency from some set of attributes, let's call it X, to all of the attributes of a relation, um, does that mean that X is a key? So I've, I've told you that if, if, X is a, if X is a key, then a mapping from X, sorry, a functional dependency from X to the entire relation will always be a functional dependency. But is the reverse true? No. No. Why? Can you give a counter example? Maybe a super key. Exactly. Can you define a super key? Uh, define it. Uh, what is it? What does it mean for a key, for some set of attributes to be a super key of a relation? Subset of that um, keys, if there are four keys in a super key, then subset of uh, that is also a key. 
Okay, so basically a, a super key is a key plus a couple of extra attributes. So a subset of, of a super key is a key, but the, the, the super key, their keys have this notion of minimality. So uh, a key is the minimal set of attributes that defines a particular, that uh, is unique for a particular, is a minimal set of attributes uh, that uniquely identifies a given row of a relation. So we kind of have the converse here. So if if um, if there is a functional dependency from x to r, then x is a super key, but it's not guaranteed that x is a key. Um, now the other the other functional dependency I gave you earlier was that uh, an officer's rank determines the officer's salary. So that, that, is, that is a very simple functional dependency, uh, and it's one that comes from the scheme. Uh, any questions on this, by the way? So um, if I were to project a table down to this one column, R, and if I found two rows where the, well, let me draw that example before. Uh, so the only two columns we're interested are in are rank and uh, salary. So we had captain, we had uh, the uh, commander, two commanders, uh, and we had lieutenant. And then we had salaries. Project down to just this one column. These two rows are equivalent. If we, and these two rows are equivalent. And the implication then is that if these two rows are equivalent in the R column, or in all of the columns that are defined in the, uh, on the left-hand side of the functional dependency, then they must be equivalent in the, right, in the columns in the right-hand side. So, for example, if I were to change that to 1300, that would no longer be a functional dependency. And again, this is a, an application constraint. Uh, so this is how you define uh, the data to be correct. But one way that you can say this data is correct if there is a functional dependency from uh, R to S. So now this introduces a number of, of problems. Yes? Uh, can functional dependency be uh, a primary key attribute? Uh, yeah, so a primary key, uh, sorry, from, from a primary key or to a primary key? From a Yeah, so a primary key is uh, always, uh, there's a functional dependency from the primary key to the entire relation. Uh, could you speak up a little? Uh, the example which you have given over there, uh, it doesn't suit with a, uh, if R is a primary key. Well, R isn't a primary key in this case. It can't be, because there are multiple copies of yeah, certain R's. Uh, can functional dependency occur when R is also a primary key? Um, so a primary key relation. I'm not entirely sure I get the distinction you're making. Uh, so if, so in this case, OID is a primary key. 
So there is a functional there is a, there is a functional dependency from OID to all of the columns on the right hand side. Um, you can something I'll get into in a actually one more slide is uh, this idea that you can actually manipulate that. So by telling you that there is a functional dependency from OID to OID name, post, rank, and salary, that is equivalent to me, or not equivalent, but that from that you can infer that there is also a functional dependency uh, from OID to, let's say, rank, or from OID to salary. Does that clarify your question, or? Okay. Right, so this is exactly the same example. Uh, right, so if, um, if you project down to OID, mm -hmm. so this, this is sort of a, a proof by trivial uh, lack of contradiction. Um, if I project down to OID, then I'm never going to have two primary keys that agree with one another. If I did, for some mysterious reason, then it would only be correct if uh, OID1 corresponded to Sheridan, OID1 had a post of, of 5, and so forth. Does that answer your question? OK. Um, right. So this introduces a couple of uh, sort of data consistency issues that we need to check for. Like I said, functional dependencies are a form of data consistency. Now we have to have a, a, we have a couple of, of ways that these functional dependencies can be violated. Uh, so for example, what's to stop us from just updating the salary? That's one particular problem that we need to be able to, det to detect. We need to know that um, if there are two different commanders, and I update one of their salaries, I had better update all of their salaries. And keep in mind, if there's only one commander, then it's perfectly safe to update that one row. Next question is, how, um, what happens if we insert a new, uh, a new rank? So this table doesn't contain any salary for an admiral. If we were to insert an admiral into the um, into the table, we'd have to figure out somehow through some mysterious voodoo uh, what that admiral's salary was. We don't have this information off the top of our heads. And finally, uh, sort of the dual of that: what happens if we delete the last row that contains uh, the salary for a given cap uh, for a given rank? So if I delete row one. All of a sudden, I've just lost all information about what, uh, what the default salary is uh, for a captain. So all things considered, this is not an ideal representation for this particular data set. And what we'd like to be able to do is, is sort of quantify that, um, come up with a, a way of saying, this is a good way of representing a data set. And that particular example doesn't satisfy it. Now I'm going to uh, lead you through a couple more things here, um, a couple more things on functional dependencies because these are going to be required for, yes? What is the problem with insertion of the insignia with an admin? So there's no, uh, the, the problem, sorry? No, so there's no dependence. Um, we can put in any. So the question is, um, what's the what's the actual problem with inserting uh, a tuple with uh, admiral? There's no consistency issue. This this is more of a, a logical design uh, issue. If you insert a row uh, with admiral, you have to feed it. You, you have to give it a salary value, or make that salary value known which you generally don't want to do. Um, and that salary has to come from somewhere. Inserting, actually, one more, 
I mean, subsequent appearance values will have a problem because we have to maintain the constant dependency. Right. So then, if there's a second one, then yes, we actually have to go through the table and figure out what the uh, what the salary default salary of an admiral is. But for the first, we don't have to worry about anything. Uh, for the first one, we don't have to do a consistency check, but we still have to get that value from somewhere. The, okay, from the sorry, from the database's perspective, it, you're right. It doesn't doesn't matter at all. Um, the set any subsequent inserts will have to will have to do that check. Um, but from a, a uh, from the database designer's perspective, uh, that information is going to have to come from somewhere. And ideally, you want to know you want the database to know that information even beforehand. So there, okay. I guess this is actually you could actually think of this as two separate problems. One from a, an actual consistency validation uh, problem and more of a logical database design problem. And We'd like to we'd like to address both. And regarding other kind of consistency problem, uh, the consistency uh, with deletion? Uh, no, with insert. Yeah, that you said uh, we have to check for the consistency. Uh, so it's the same thing as, as updates. If we insert a second uh, copy of a tuple with a particular rank, we need to make sure that uh, all other tuples with that rank have the same value. For the first one. Not for the first one. Can't we just like insert with a new ID, like say six in this case? Mm -hmm. Can't we just update it like with six? If you uh, so if we insert a new, uh, we insert a new row with an OID of six admin. and with rank admin. Okay. And uh, say you have an OID say two, and you have an OID say one. Can't we just change it to six so that it's consistent? Oh, uh, so. It, uh, Yes, in the the consistency issue that uh, we're we're trying that the consistency issue isn't isn't on the OID. Um, you're right. If uh, if you insert an OID of, of two into this table, you're already violating the primary key constraint, or sorry, the key constraint. Yeah. Um, but even if you insert an OID of six with a rank of let's say captain, then it had better be the case. That, that captain has a salary of 2,000. You're inserting a rank, uh, an officer with a rank of admiral. It can be whatever you want for the first tuple, but then if you, if you then insert an OID of seven with a rank of admiral, then that admiral had better have the same salary. Okay, so these, these functional dependencies, there's this, uh, this you, we can look at them as, as something that we can manipulate. So just like we mani manipulate relational algebra, rewrite it, come up with, with various new uh, relational algebra expressions from the original one, we can do something similar for uh, functional dependencies. So for example, if, uh, if we have two sets of, of attributes and one of them is a subset of the other, there is always going to be a functional dependency from the bigger set to the smaller set. Pick any, any one, two, three, or four or five of these, and I can guarantee you that if you pick any subset of those, there's a, a functional dependency. So from name post to just post, there's a, um, if they agree on name and post, they had better also agree on just post. We can also take any existing functional dependency that we have, and we can add attributes. So if they agree on, uh, let's say, rank and salary already, sorry, if there's a functional dependency from rank to salary, then there would also be, uh, better be a functional dependency from rank, sorry, name and rank to name and salary. So Sheridan, Captain, as a functional dependency to share it in 2000. You're not actually adding any information. So, uh, if they agree on if they agree on X, you already know that they must agree on Y. Now you're just saying if they also agree on Z, then they also agree on Z. Fairly obvious. Um, 
And then there's this uh, transitivity business. So if you have a functional dependency from X to Y and another one from Y to Z, then you also have a functional dependency uh, from X to Z. And straight that, if you have a functional dependency from OID to rank and rank to salary, then you also have a functional dependency from uh, rank salary, or from uh, OID to salary. Um, and a little bit of notation, I'm going to say that, so these rules allow us to derive a new set of functional dependencies. So I give you a set of functional dependencies and you can give me back a new set of functional dependencies um, containing all, all of the applications of these rules that you can possibly apply. Um, and we're going to call that F+. Plus. F superscript plus, or the closure of F. Is that clear to everyone? Any questions? Okay. Uh, two more simple rules that we can actually derive from the previous ones. Uh, so if we know that uh, X implies Y and X Im uh, implies Z, then we can also derive uh, X implies YZ. How do we come about that? How can we derive that from these guys? Yes. Okay. Uh, run me, run me through it. So, uh, if x leads to y, then well, okay, so what, what is Z in this case? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so we have, we have X leads to Y and X leads to Z. So, so we're, applying, uh, we're applying augmentation uh, as XZ leads to YZ? It's augmentation and transitivity. Uh, can you go to the next step? X, uh, in the first, XZ uh, gives YZ with augmentation. Uh, XZ gives YZ okay. with augmentation, okay. okay. And then... Yeah, X is what's that? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, it's just sets of attributes. So it's um, ABC, DEF, that's the same as DEF, ABC. Okay, um, we can actually do the, the reverse as well. So if we know that X maps to YZ, we can do something uh, really similar to get X maps to Y and X maps to Z. Um, something to note uh, for those of you uh, inclined towards uh, it. Yes? So the X, X, how can I change to X? X, X. Uh, uh, it's, so uh, thi what, what this is, this is just a set unit. Oh, I see, I see. Right, uh, so I'm, my notation here, x, y, means the union of, if I were to actually write this properly, that would be uh, x union y, z union y, and x union x. So this, this is basically just the shorthand I'm using. Two letters concatenated means the union of those two sets. Um, so for those of you uh, logically inclined, these are uh, these rules are uh, sound. That is to say, they're completely internally consistent uh, over functional dependencies, and they're also complete. Um, basically, any any rules that you can derive uh, about functional dependencies, uh, you can derive from these three three rules. So what is the definition of sound? Uh, internally consistent. Uh, there, there is no way you can derive a, uh, using only these three rules, there is no way you can derive something uh, contradictory, like, um, actually I don't even know what a contradiction would look like in this case. Um, X has a functional dependency, probably something like X has a functional dependency to nothing. Um. <coughs> okay, uh, so give me, uh, let me give you a little more of an example of, of how this looks like. Um, let's say we have a, a table contracts, and that contract table has a bunch of columns. Uh, the contract ID, uh, the supplier ID, the project ID, I'm going to use the J for that, uh, the department ID, the part ID, the quantity, and the value. So in this case, I'm going to tell you uh, that C is a key. So we have uh, a functional dependency from C to the entire relation. I'm going to tell you also that um, every single project uh, will, per will always have, um, that for a given project and a given part uh, requested, that's going to be exactly one contract. So we have a functional dependency from JP to C. I'm also going to tell you that uh, the department, that any department will purchase at most one part from any given supplier. So we have uh, a functional dependency from SD to P. So we can take uh, any questions. So we can take the first two rules and we can combine them to since we have. Uh, a functional dependency from JP to C and C to the rest of the relation uh, and get a functional, through transitivity we get a, a functional dependency from JP uh, to the entire relation. Um, from this, we can add the J column to both sides by augmentation. Now we have a, a functional dependency from SDJ to JP, which has a functional dependency to the entire relation, uh, so we can actually infer that there is a functional dependency from SDJ to the entire relation. And that lets us know that SDJ is at least a super key. Okay, 
So this kind of reasoning is quite helpful because it allows us to very quickly identify when there's some sort of redundancy in the data that we're storing. Um, on the other hand, it's also a very expensive form of reasoning. Um, this, this idea of closure uh, can contain an exponential number of, uh, of functional dependencies. So we generally don't want to compute the entire closure all at once. Uh, on the other hand, in general, what we're interested in uh, is not necessarily the entire closure. What we're interested in is whether there's a functional dependency between two particular sets of columns. So the question we want to be able to answer is whether or not uh, that functional dependency exists in the closure. So I'm going to define another term uh, called the attribute closure, which basically is the set of all attributes that appear um, for which a functional dependency uh, appears in the closure. Why do we need attribute closure? Sorry? Why do we need attribute closure? So the idea is, so the, the big question we want to be able to very efficiently answer is whether there is a functional dependency from x to y. So given an x and given a y, we want to know if there is a uh, functional dependency between those two. If we can compute the attribute closure, uh, so, which one was it? Um, so this decomposition rule, we can take. So we can take any functional dependency and we can reduce. We can cut pieces of it away. So if there's a functional dependency from x to some some attributes, it better be the case that you can take a subset of those attributes. If they agree on x. If you know that if two tuples agree on x, then they also agree on y and z, then you also know that if they agree on x, they'd also better agree on just y. So you can always, you can always uh, if you have x goes to some set of attributes, you can always cut that down. And so what, what this is basically going to let us, us do is if y is in the attribute closure of x plus, and if we have a very quick way of computing the attribute closure of x, then we can very quickly determine whether or not this entire functional dependency is in uh, the closure of f. So the, the basic algorithm for this, I'm not going to sketch it out in too, much, uh, in too much detail, but basically it's, it's pretty much the standard, uh, a, a standard process that one goes about in, in logic programming. Um, you have a set of rules, and each of those rules is going to uh, expand the, is going to give you more abilities, more, more things that you can and the, the algorithm for computing um, the attribute closure is, is to sort of just keep building up uh, the set of attributes that x maps to and keep applying uh, transitivity with various combinations in that uh, sense to, to expand that out. <laughs> I'll give you a little bit of an example. Um, so let's say we have a set of uh, functional dependencies from A to B, B to C, and C, D to E. Does that imply that a, uh, there's a functional dependency from A to E? No. No. Why? B is missing. B also Ah, OK. So is, OK. So you would need, so there's a, a transitive closure from, uh, sorry, you can go from A to B, you can go from A to B, uh, A to C through B. Now that you have C in, in the attribute closure of A, you can also, uh, you, can, you can look at any other rules containing C, and you can sort of trace out further from there. 
Except in this case, you also need D to be in your attribute set. So basically, yes, if you would have, if that particular, uh, that particular functional dependency doesn't exist. But the, the sort of equivalent questions that you can ask are, uh, sorry, um, the, the sort of equivalent uh, questions that you can ask are, given that particular set of functional dependencies, does that set of functional dependencies imply the existence of such a functional dependency? Um, does that, um, or in equivalently stated, uh, is there a functional dependency from A to E in this, this closure, as an equivalent question, or is E in the, the closure, the attribute closure of A plus? And that's, like, once again, an equivalent question. So These are all they, yes, e each of those are, are three perfectly equivalent questions. So, so answer is, uh, yeah, exactly. So if, whatever the answer is to any one of them, it's exactly the same answer for, for all of them. And the idea is that this is the most efficient to compute. Okay. Well, okay. So... Um, Getting back to this idea of decomposition. Um, so I've been, been throwing all of this stuff with uh, functional dependencies at you. The, the reason that I've been doing that is that that's going to help us answer this question of when is it when it's useful to, de to decompose a particular relation. And that definition is going to be in the uh, expressed through a concept called normal forms. The idea of a normal form is that we can, we can say that a relation is in a normal form if uh, it obeys a certain set of properties. And by saying that a relation is in one of the, the normal forms that we're going to discuss, uh, certain kinds of problems, certain kind of consist, kinds of consistency issues uh, will be either avoided or, at the very least, mitigated. And the idea is then going to be that we can decompose a relation, we can break it up into chunks uh, that bring it either uh, into one of these normal forms or, at the very least, closer to, some of, to one of these, these normal forms. And functional dependencies are going to help us detect, uh, basically, whether or not something is in a normal form. So, um, the first, we're going to talk about two of these. There's actually eight, nine. Wikipedia has a really nice article on this, if you're interested. Uh, there's about eight or nine different normal forms. Uh, we're going to talk about two of them today. Uh, one called voice cod normal form, uh, which, has, which is a relation that satisfies the following two properties. So first off, if Given a relation R, and given a set of functional dependencies on R, uh, we're going to call that set F, then that relation is in Boyce-Codd normal form if, for every single functional dependency that we can infer from F, one of the two properties is satisfied. Either A is a subset of X, this is the sort of trivial, uh, anything can satisfy this functional dependency. Or x contains a key for r. Uh, the way I've, I've heard this said is that uh, this, this is sort of like a, um, no, I'm sorry, the other one. Um, basically, the idea is that every single attribute of x, uh, sorry, every single um, attribute of the relation exists specifically to support that, uh, that relation's key. If there's an attri uh, the, the attribute, th there's no way to predict relationships between any two attributes in the column, other than uh, when one of them is a key. Sure. Um, so basically, for any sort of 
functional dependency that we can infer from functional dependencies that the user has provided us with. Either one of those functional dependencies is perfectly trivial, or uh, sorry, uh, either the, the functional dependency that we've inferred is, is completely trivial. So x, a is a subset of x. That, that's the obvious one. Or the left-hand side of the functional dependency is a superset of the key, is a super key for R. The, the sort of uh, way of interpreting that is that any relation in voice cod normal form is purely a mapping from some value to some set of dependent values. P the set of dependent values. So this would be like for example O I D O I D um, name rank um, ship Unless I should put in salary. So ignore this for now. Name, rank, and ship. There's no relationship between name and ship. If I name someone Bob, or if I have an officer named Bob, there's no way, uh, according to the schema, there's no way I can infer that Bob is on some particular ship. There may be in a particular instance, there may only be one officer named Bob, and if that's the case, you can, you can identify the ship for that particular Bob, but in general, there's no way to go from name to ship. There's no relationship between any of these. Now, if I add in the salary field, all of a sudden, there is now an external relationship between rank and salary. And that's basically what's prevent uh, that that is the, the limiting factor. So now we have a functional dependency from rank to salary. Rank is not part of a super key. So, for this so it's not a piece. So it, it, this is not in VCF. Yes. And I believe I'm out of time. So we're going to resume this on uh, with lack of viability on Wednesday. Any questions, by the way? What is the median for project? Uh, sorry? Median for project? Um, it went up pretty drastically after I corrected the bug in the grading script. Um, I, you should be able to access that on, Pia, uh, on uh, Blackboard. If you can't, I will... Actually, no, sorry. I think there's something that I disabled. We should be able to access it with, uh, shortly. I... I can't tell off the top of my head, probably somewhere in the, after the regrade, probably somewhere in the 70s, 80s. Uh, after the mix, there were quite a few more grades above my head.